Um, we have Ms. Heather McAtee, the, um, stop me if I get your title wrong, the mm -hmm. Associate Director of Athletics for Academics and Eligibility. Close enough. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, at the University of Kentucky. And she has been given this presentation with us for the last 14 years we've done this program. So thank you again, Heather, for joining us and rescheduling with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And, and again, thank you for the two of you um, that join. And we're going to let Heather take it from here. Thank you. Uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you to St. X. This is a very important presentation. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, eligibility is something that we want to make sure that you and your sons are aware of so that you have the ability to go anywhere that you want. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I am just going to put up a little handout here from the NCAA and kind of talk through this. So hopefully you all can see my screen and everything. So the NCAA uses an organization called the Eligibility Center. And the way that I describe the Eligibility Center is it is more or less the guidance counselor of the NCAA. What they do is they look at transcripts, they make sure that students are taking courses that are going to be preparing them for college, getting grades that are going to prepare them to be successful in college, and making sure that we are kind of aware where they are from a starting point coming into college. So I am an expert in Division I. I'm going to discuss Division I. I can talk about Division II to a point. It's very similar to Division I. Division Three is if you are admitted to their university, you are eligible. So eligibility for Division Division three school is fairly simple. If you meet their admission process, you are admitted. For division one and division two, they are looking for 16 core courses. They are looking for courses that are academic in nature. Um, and the breakdown is going to be slightly different between division one and division two. So we're just going to talk about division one here. So for a division one student, you have to have completed four years, four units of English, three units of math, algebra one or higher two years of science, one of which has to have a lab with it, an additional year of English math or science, which is usually covered by the third year of science that you take your junior year, two years of social science, and then four additional units of anything that I mentioned and foreign languages. So that breaks into your 64 is making sure that we have that's going to prepare you. They are going to take a GPA just from these 16 courses. So when we ask students sometimes, what's your GPA? They're going to say what their GPA is based on their transcript. If their courses and the grades in these core courses are a little bit different than what's on their transcript and what's in courses that are not being considered, their NCAA core could be a little bit different. So if they are strong students in these core areas, their GPA is going to be fairly simple and fairly similar. If they are different, if these core courses are weaker than, let's say, gym and music and art, that their NCAA core GPA might be a little bit lower than what you see on your transcript. So that just be aware that when we're talking about the NCAA, they're only looking at 16 units, and these are the 16 units that they're looking at. What they're looking for is they're looking for a minimum GPA of at least a 2.0. So once again, I know at the school you guys go to, um, you guys are really prepared to come to college. So you're probably like, oh my goodness, that's simple. Great news. You guys are good to go. Um, there's also going to be a GPA that's required of a 2.3, and that's going to be needed to be able to compete your first year. So once again, St. X does an amazing job, especially if your students are in athletics right now, of making sure that you're hitting this. Their core curriculum that students go through as a general student is probably going to cover this easily without worrying about your athletic status. But it's something, once again, just to think about as as you get those grades, as you progress through high school, as you get closer to the end and closer to graduation, making sure you have these 16 courses and knowing what your GPA is in those, what the grades are and what your GPA. So if we have the 16 core, the 2.3, we graduate on time, we're going to be known as what's a qualifier. And what a qualifier is able to do is practice, compete and receive an athletic scholarship their first year. 
If for some reason you have the 16 core, but your GPA falls below that 2.3, so a 2.299 to a 2.0, and they don't round up, so 2.299 to a 2.0, you're going to be known as an academic red shirt. So an academic red shirt is not able to compete their first year. They can practice, they can receive a scholarship, but they cannot compete. So once again, coming out of St. X, I would anticipate every student is going to be a qualifier. And this is the part that I usually can go pretty quickly through because you guys really do have a solid group of people that are leading you and a really, really good curriculum where you guys are above that 2.3 requirement. So some of the things that are a little bit different, and I'm just going to touch base on this, are test scores. As we know, COVID has kind of changed some things out there. And before COVID, test scores were required by the NCAA, and the test scores they were using were ACT and SAT test scores. And they had a scale based on what your test score was, your GPA had to be a certain scale, and they called it a sliding scale. Well, over COVID, with the difficulty of having some tests and the test availability at the beginning, and then realizing that there were some um, questions about test scores and just certain people not testing as well, uh, the NCAA has kind of put test scores on the back burner. And then in January, they actually voted to take it out of the legislation. So up until this point, students from COVID till now have been able to be certified through the NCAA without test scores and received a special waiver. Starting with the class that's coming up, the 2023 class, test scores are not needed at all by the NCAA. They won't ask for them in the eligibility center. If your son is already registered for the eligibility center and you have a task that's already in there asking to submit the test scores, that task is going to go away. It's something that is just going to be eliminated from legislation and from the NCAA end is not needed at all. I'm going to give a little bit of my opinion with test scores. Um, a lot of colleges have also moved to either not needing test scores or being test score optional. And I'm at a school where test scores are optional. I still encourage anybody to take an ACT, to take an SAT, to take it several times. Number one, schools still can use them for academic scholarship basis. Um, our test scores, if they're submitted, the unweighted GPA we need for an academic scholarship is lower than if we don't have a test score at all, the unweighted GPA to get that, um, that academic scholarship is higher. So that can benefit you. The other thing that our school uses, and I'm sure that several other universities use as well, is that we do use certain subscores of these tests to place into certain areas. So especially if you're going to be an engineering student, a business student at UK, I would definitely encourage your son to take the ACT, the SAT, and take it a couple of times because we're going to use that score for math placement. So it's something, once again, that is not necessary. It should not be looked as a, an evil thing. It should be something that looks as another option that you have to help with your admission, to help with your enrollment, to help with the progression towards your degree once you get here. So I still do encourage students to take it. Whether or not you actually submit it is up to you. Um, in addition, after you leave college and as you go through college, I know standardized tests are kind of like evil words sometimes, but depending on what career path your son takes, they are going to be taking standardized test a lot of their lives. If they want to get into grad school or to medical school, they're going to be taking standardized tests to get into those colleges. If they decide to be a plumber, there's a standardized test to pass your plumbing test. So once again, it's good to have that experience and have that test taking skill, keeping it honed as you go in. So that, that's kind of what I'm going to say about test scores. So it's out there. Um, the NCAA does not need them anymore, which is amazing. What we're talking about too, and I, and I talk with St. X and they don't really offer this, but if for some reason online courses, they've been really flexible through COVID. If you do decide to take an online course, it just needs to be approved starting September 1st. So if there's some reason you wanna take Florida Virtual, take Apex Learning, those are all approved. You can continue to do that. If you were taking something that you know wasn't approved or needs to go through the approval process, that's just something that I would suggest 
running it through St. X. If they have questions, they can go ahead and, and contact me. So I'm talking about this great eligibility center. I don't know if you guys are registered with it yet. So what I would encourage is if your sons are interested in division one, division two, or even division three, to go ahead and set up your eligibility center account. And that's going to be eligibilitycenter.org. Okay, not com, org. And what it's going to do is it's going to take you into setting up the account. There's going to be a couple different options now. We have um, with Division Three, they have an amateurism only section. You're going to want to do the academic and amateurism certification. So there's kind of the full certification, new option that's relative since Division Three has gone to this, relatively different. I would suggest registering for it early. I don't know if you all are familiar with things called official visits, but those are visits where the school can pay for you to come visit and spend 48 hours on their campus and pay the expenses. In order to qualify for an official visit, you got to be registered with the Eligibility Center. So once again, just jot that down, eligibilitycenter.org, set that up, go ahead and do that. If your son is ending his junior year, I would encourage St. X to send the transcript to upload that transcript with the six semester grades. The NCAA will do an evaluation for you. So once again, if you aren't being actively recruited by a school at this second in time, it would be a way to kind of see and make sure that you're still on track for everything that you need to do to make sure. Because once again, these are pretty important things we're talking about. We're talking about practice competition and possible scholarship. So that's something I always encourage students and parents is just to know where you stand. If you need a little work, figure out what we need to do to get you to where you have all of those options available. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen right now and I am going to pause for a second if anybody has any questions, I know this is very hard because I'm just sitting here talking to some black boxes, but if anyone has any questions, if you don't feel comfortable coming off your mic, just go ahead and send them through the um, message. I can't even think of what it's called, chat, the chat box, and we can just have a conversation. I think you're doing great. Are you there? I can hear you. Yeah, no, I think you're doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So any other questions? Say next people, did I miss anything? No, you are fabulous. Um, that was great. And um we um we were listening to about the amateurism because I know that's a thing. So thank you for. I meant to ask you that before you went on. I should have known. I should have known you were going to candle it all. Well, and like I said, they've kind of rolled some of these things out, and I don't know if you know, just with us being so separate right now, but Division Three does go through an amateurism certification now, so they have an amateurism only certification. The other thing they have too is they have a profile page where you don't pay any money. So if you're doing a profile and you're not paying for anything, you just have a page. It gets confusing because everyone gets a 10-digit ECID. They they do get an ID. Um, I get it with internationals every now and then that I, I can't see them unless there's something there. Now, mm -hmm. when we talk about the fee, I believe that it is $100 for domestic students to register. If for some reason somebody does have a financial situation in which there might be free or reduced lunches, that there might be some type of financial situation, the school is able to file a fee waiver for you. So when you register, there is a point where you put, I'd like to qualify for a fee waiver. Yeah. You need to let St. X know that you have asked and requested that because they are the ones that go in through their end and apply that fee waiver electronically. So that's something that's out there because a hundred dollars can be a lot of money for people. So I don't want that to discourage anyone for, well, I want to do this for my son, but this is just a lot of money right now. Just make sure you communicate with St. X and don't let that be a deterrent of not registering. Got it. Yes. Anybody yeah. else? I have a, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
So I guess I'm confused on what that amateur certification is. So you said go to the eligibility center and go over to the academic area and register, right? Correct, correct. So the eligibility center actually handles two different certifications. If you're as old as I am, when it started, it used to be called the Clearinghouse, and it was out of Kansas City, and they did academic certification. Well, the NCAA has kind of transformed it into something called the Eligibility Center. And what they do is they do the academic certification, which is what I just spoke about right now, the 16 core, the stuff, certification. Every student that is Division I or Division II also goes through an amateurism certification. And what that's doing, and the definition of amateurism over the last couple of years has changed as well, but what they're doing is they're making sure that students are coming in and are not have not professionalized themselves based on whatever the rules are at the moment in time. Um, like I said, we've seen all kinds of changes in the last couple of years, so we're on our toes. Um, for most domestic students, in the US, most of our students, high school students are amateurs. So it's as much as just answering questions, making sure that you haven't been on a professional team, you don't have a professional agent, um, other people are not paying your expenses, those kind of things, you're gonna mark no on that. And it's something that's pretty easy. Some sports like golf and tennis, some international students, their structure is set up differently that they may get some kind of expenses paid related to competition that's going to be a little more extensive review um, but what you're going to want if you're looking division one or division two it's going to be academic and amateurism certification account if you're not looking for those two divisions if you're only looking for division three it's just going to be strictly the amateurism certification and that one's a little bit cheaper because they don't have to do all the transcript work from that end the only the other yeah. division we have to is naia so if you are looking at any NAIA schools, they have a whole different process. They have a different clearinghouse that they go through. Um, you would not register with the eligibility center if you're not looking to go with an NCAA school. Okay. Go ahead, Alice, sorry, go ahead. No, I, well, I was just gonna ask, and I know this may not come into play right now, but when you talk about being paid in competition, how does the NIL rules fall into that? Or That's that what I was going to quote. That, that was exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little more complicated, um, especially coming from the high school to college end. I would say that if your sons are approached, um, you know, if if they're receiving some type of NIL, in you know, inquiries at the high school at, at the high school level, they're probably pretty good athletes. I would definitely make sure that their high school coaches are involved. And if they're in the recruiting process, I would definitely let the recruiting coaches know and loop in their compliance office as well, just to make sure that you're not doing anything that might jeopardize. I used to work in compliance a lot. I don't know the amateurism rules. And like I said, things have changed and what was not permissible even three years ago is completely different now. Um, you know, I, I, I know I'm working with some athletes at a very high level in one of our sports that you, they're at a school that's used to be a professional organization, only have professional athletes that now have college students that are looking to go into college and the documentation they're providing is very extensive uh, as far as what they're doing. So I would just give you that advice that if there are opportunities for your sons to receive some type of payment endorsement, I would run it by their high school coach, their AAU coach, their club coach, and get them linked into somebody, you know, in a University of Kentucky compliance office, you are always welcome to call. I don't want to, you know, get all the, if there's another school that you're like, oh, UK, no way, they don't know what they're doing. Every, every division one school has a compliance office. And if it's a school you're interested in, it never hurts to send an email, to pick up the phone, to ask some questions. But I think your, your high school coaches or your club coaches are the best place to start from that end. Because I okay. think sports are different okay. too. Yeah, it's, trust me, we have athletes that I work with right now that make way more than I do. 
they make it more than everybody in my little floor over here. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's their, their, their ability dictates that that's what their market value is. So I am glad that we've yeah. come to a point where we can do that, where athletes are able to profit off their name. Um, you know, but it's, it's one of those that you still have to be careful. There's still rules that are behind this just because we've loosened up this legislation doesn't mean we don't have any rules. And we have to remind our coaches, we still do have some rules. It's helpful, yeah, thank that's, you. That's, that's great, thanks. Yeah, and, and like I said, we, we've, always had some in, we've always had some legislation that's allowed like modeling. A lot of things that happen prior to college enrollment, it's a lot more free. Um, but if you're looking for endorsements, yeah, I mean, nowadays it doesn't take much. You just have to post something on Instagram and you can make a lot of money. Um, I was talking to one of my gymnasts. I, I'm like, you get a different product every day. And she's like, oh, sometimes these companies send me this and these companies will give me money. And this, if I get this many posts, I'm like, geez, this is a whole different world than what I know. Right. <laughs> I got to figure out how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, will you be sending or posting that the information that you just shared? Absolutely. Let me see. And what I can do is I will send it. Let me see if I can post it here. I am not the most technologically. Heather, you can email me anything and we can get it out. I will email it because I, I the do key, not the, Alex, the, key, the key to me is the eligibilitycenter.org. I think you, if you mess around there, I think you're going to get your, I think that's, that's a good resource. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And then the same thing too, is once schools add you, as you start to get recruited by schools and like, I will add students to my end. Once you are, you'll then have access to their graduation rates. You'll have access to like the initial eligibility guide. You will have a lot of information once you register. I, I think that's the great, that's the great thing to do. And just so you know, in our office, we will process those initial transcripts um, Miss Williams in our office has a has a count to NCAA and can post that immediately. And then we will be sending processing the final transcripts if the student decides to continue and move forward with playing collegiate um, sports. So um, I just had a student email me asking if he could have help with filling out the eligibility form. So I know the coaches will be there to help as well, but um, as Heg and I are available too, to either help point them in direction, make sure they're on the right track. That's what we're here for as well. well I'm going to sign off. Thank you, ladies. This was great. Appreciate yes. it very much. Very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you. The only, the only other thing, if I could just say one other thing, and it's going to be very similar to most schools is academic deadlines, academic scholarship deadlines. Most students December 1st for most schools is a deadline. Your UK, it is a hard and fast deadline. I was just told we had 31,000 applications for our freshman class. So it, once again, even if you're getting an athletic scholarship, I am always about getting as much money as you can. Just keep that idea in your mind as you look at schools, figure out what their academic deadline is and make sure that those applications are complete so you don't miss out on any of that money. That, that's the last thing I just want to say. Heather, that brings up a question. So when you get a, when you get a scholarship, uh, is, is that a kind of a pre-done deal that it's for so many years or for that year, or is it negotiated or how, how does that necessarily done per sport because I have kids that are going to play collegiate sports and different things and I can I can only imagine like so many scholarships are given some are part some are full how does that how is that actually determined or well, do you know first of all yeah and, and that's a great question and, and it's it's very variable um it's going to be dependent it is kind of negotiated it's kind of what's available as follows it the the scholarship dead the scholarship requirements and what we have has not been changed. They're talking about changing it and and, cha and lifting it and making it bigger and letting it be more flexible. But what you have is you have two types of sports. You have equivalency sports and you have headcount sports. Headcount sports, every it counts as one person on scholarship counts as a number. So let's just take men's basketball. Men's basketball is a headcount sport. They get 13 scholarships for their team. And if we're, uh, with our school, we're fully funded. So we have 13 full scholarships. 13 but golf is probably not. Because they're counted. <laughs> Baseball is, um, 
gosh, 12.3. That's how many scholarships they get for their entire team. They're an equivalency sport. So they have to divide up that pot of 12.3 by oh, I see. the I people. Guess. So depending yeah. on the sport, first of all, kind of dictates what we have as far as if they're equivalency or head count. So that's kind of it. Yeah. Now, as far as is it a single year? Is it a multi-year? Is it a five-year scholarship? The coach is going to discuss that with you. Um, that's why I always encourage academic money. But, but, um, but Heather, so Heather, if you lock that in, let's say let's say your kid gets in, let's say he gets a full, full or a, let's say it's a let's say he gets injured. Does he, will he still maintain that scholarship? Yes. Um, the NCAA does not allow us to take away scholarships or not renew scholarships due to athletic reasons. Um, that sounds good. And so you have someone that just doesn't perform and, you know, it's, it's hard for us at times because if you're here on an academic scholarship and you don't keep your academics up, you lose it, but it does protect the students. So if you have a student who is injured they will not lose their scholarship because of the injury. If you have a student who is injured and can't participate anymore, there's something called in a medical exemption where the student can keep the scholarship and then they're taken off of the scholarship books for that sport. So once again, it encourages schools that are able to continue that funding to keep that student so they can earn their degree. Because once again, that's that should be the main goal is even if you advance and play professionally, getting that degree should be everyone's main goal of coming here. So, you know, if based yeah, Heather, on guess, that, you can't this, lose your scholarship. This is not a cynical question. It's not like a conspiratorial question, but I'm going to ask it because you probably have some insight. Do, do the coaches, when they know they have a kid that's academically um, able, do they work the academic scholarship to preserve the athletic scholarship? I mean, is that is that a norm? Is that happen or is that taboo? What I just said or what? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I think that the coaches know that the biggest scholarship offer is what they want to do for the student because it, it's competitive. They're this working. Is a it. They're working. It. And, yeah. Yeah. So so once again, is if we have academic students and trust me, I'm especially in the sports of baseball, men's soccer, a lot of our sports, especially our male sports, men's swimming, um, they're not full scholarship. Their scholarship allotment is actually smaller than the women's side because of Title IX. They are looking for academic students that are going to get academic money so they can then don't have to give as much athletic money, but it's actually a bigger you know, a bigger scholarship than what they're working. They could. All right. That's good to know. Yeah. So, so, so once again, I, I think that no matter what the, if, if they don't, let, let's say they try to short you and they, they were going to give you 20%, but you qualify for this money and they cut it back. Some other school is going to give you that 20% plus the academic scholarship. They're, they're, they're in competition with other schools for athletes as well. Yeah. So, and I can't speak for every institution. I'm going to for ours because I love, I love my university. I've been here since 2006. I think we have good coaches that are here for the right reasons and want to do right by the young people they're bringing into their program. And I would hope that that's what other college coaches want to do because that, that's why that makes total in. sense yeah that makes yeah total sense. yeah and and like I said I I think sometimes the perception that's out there is that like these coaches are more shady and they're they're you know that the students are kind of you know students have a lot of power right now with the transfer portal that's out there with the cost of attendance with NIL they have a lot more power and if they don't feel they're being treated right they, they have the ability to kind of speak up. So, yeah, I, I do think the coaches would love to use the academic money in addition to what they can offer because it's going to be a bigger package. As a, again, I, thank you. That was good. Appreciate it. More people should have joined. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sunny outside. I get it. <laughs> well, I got to get going. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. Oh, sorry. Alice, do you have any questions? No, I think we're good. I learned a lot. Oh, good. good. I'm glad. Glad. And if you um, have anything, just let um, Ms. Hager myself know. And um, I'm in contact with Heather, so I could, all, she's so gracious with answering any questions. So we'll get you what you need if you have questions. Okay. Okay. And Heather, sounds great. Thanks. Thank you again, Heather. We really, of course, really of course. appreciate it. And, um, and I'll email you that document. 
Yes, please send me whatever you got. And we really, really appreciate you being here tonight. Well, I am so glad you guys always ask me. I love doing this. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. All right. You guys have a great night. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.